Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right. My name is Charlie Cottrell. I'm the director of the Institute of Public Administration, Public Policy, and Public Service at St. Mary's University. And I welcome, want to welcome all of you here this evening. I especially want to welcome those guests from the community and especially, especially welcome all of the students who are here tonight. We really appreciate you being here. This is what Community Conversations is about and what it's for. The institute that sponsors this event, Community Conversations, has specific purposes. Education is the first one, but also research in the community, research statewide and nationally, is also what we're about. And Community Conversations was designed to have an informal, civil, interactive conversation on issues that are specific issues for our city, for our region, and for our state. Uh, far too often, we only hear the 30-second soundbite, or we hear talking heads who are talking beyond each other. While there's no assured agreement in any of our community conversations, it is a living room, as it were, for St. Mary's University. And if things go well, uh, we'll have an interactive session as well with questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie, who, uh, who is one of my great mentors, even though my, my grades at St. Mary's would not have reflected that. The great teaching of him and Henry Flores uh, just two men who I uh, truly respect, and it's an honor to, 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 to be here on, on, the, on campus and to be part of this, this great program dealing with such an important issue. Um, one thing I wanted to say is that we, this was, program was, had been a plan for a long time, and I think that uh, Charlie first approached me maybe June or early July, asked me to be the moderator and mentioned one of the folks he wanted to be on the panel was Councilwoman Ivy Taylor. Mm -hmm. And so we agreed to do it in early July when she was Councilwoman Ivy Taylor and I was still working for Congressman yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Joaquin Castro. So we did, so after things kind of changed in our jobs, <laughs> I didn't know if, if this would change also, but, but it, it didn't and, and, and nothing would change except I'm gonna Make sure the mayor's very comfortable tonight. If she needs anything, uh, <laughs> she will get to speak longer than anyone else this evening. Uh, and at some point tonight, we'll sing happy birthday to her, even though her birthday is in June, just to. <laughs> but it's an honor to, to, to be here for just a great event. And, and I, it doesn't surprise me that St. Mary's University would be part of a conversation be, uh, because guided by this philosophy that there's no issue to too large and too divisive that with reason and conversation and civility that it, it can't be solved. So with that, that's about most of the talking I'm going to do this evening because we have three great and vital voices who are going to take on this issue of the fact that we haven't even said its name yet is interesting, <laughs> gentrification. And so uh, first I'm going, to, I'm going to introduce them each as they give their presentation, they're each going to speak. After they are finished, the three of them have finished, is when we will open it up to uh, questions and answers. And uh, with that, we'll get started with our first presenter, Maria. Maria Berezaba was born in Laredo, Texas. Mrs. Berezaba has been involved in San Antonio politics and environmental protection for a number of years. She was the first elected Latina Mexican-American on the San Antonio City Council, serving from 1981 through 1990, and has also worked in appointed capacities such as the Mayor's Citizens Water Committee. During her tenure, she has expressed opposition to a number of local and regional projects, including the annexation of SeaWorld, tax abatements for Fiesta, Texas, sales taxes for the Alamo Dome, subsidies for PGA Village, construction of Applewhite Reservoir, and investment in the South Texas Nuclear Project. Her opposition has been rooted in environmental concerns particularly protection of the Edwards Aquifer Recharge Zone and in concerns over the inequity of using tax dollars to underwrite private developments. 
Ms. Berezabo founded the Hispania Unidas Conference. She has also carried her interest in municipal politics to the national level, serving as a board member and past president of the National League of Cities, which not on the resume is that in 1989, she ran a, it was 89, she ran a great, nearly historic race for mayor of the city. And I know because I voted for you. <laughs> she was a presidential appointee to the OES Inter-American Commission on Women and participated in the United Nations Fourth International Women's Conference held in Beijing. She earned a BA in political science from the University of Texas at San Antonio in 1979. Maria Berra Sabo. Thank you. Thank you. So can you hear me? Oh, okay. I don't trust this little thing here. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Cottrell, your, your students and staff in St. Mary's University, Marianist community, thank you so much uh, for hosting this event on such a, um, an important subject and also uh, for inviting me. Uh, I feel at home at St. Mary's. Um, gentrification exists in San Antonio today because of current predictions for growth in Texas and in San Antonio this is a critical conversation in which our community needs to engage it is a subject for the entire city we need to try and come to a community consensus on how we are going to deal with this growth housing is at the heart of growth who will benefit and who will pay. Now, I need to put a, um, a slide here. So how am I gonna do this? The red one? No, nothing happened? The, there. I brought a picture and that's because it's my first house and uh, it inspires me, so I'll look at it a little bit as I'm reading. <laughs> a discussion of the places where we live is, a prof is profoundly personal. When we discuss gentrification, not only are we talking about the places where we live, but because the, s the process of gentrification involves economics combined with race, ethnicity, class, and political clout, it is much more difficult and some people shy away from it, but we should discuss it. As we do, however, no matter how much we differ in our opinions, we must be very respectful of people when they are talking about their homes and their neighborhoods. It's their greatest investment. Gentrification can be defined in various ways. Since I go first, I'm going to read a couple of definitions. Uh, one of them I got from Webster's Online, and it's very simple. It says, the process of renewal and rebuilding accompanying the influx of middle class or affluent people into deteriorating areas that often displace poorer residents. There was another definition that I found. It was put together by a group in the Bay Area of, um, of California who are having to deal with uh, gentrification, displacement, because of the huge success of the Silicon Valley. It's a much longer uh, definition, uh, essentially saying the same thing, but with more detail. And I'll just re read the last part of it. Gentrification is driven by private developers, landlords, businesses, and corporations, and supported by the government through policies that facilitate the process of displacement, often in the form of public sub subsidies. When hearing these definitions, we can see why the topic is controversial. In San Antonio, since the 1950s, when we created the council manager form of government, our goals have been not only growth, but also expansion. And these slides reflect that reality. The first one is annexation up to 1998. And you can see how beginning in 1971, the growth uh, was mostly to the north, um, northwest uh, and, and north. And that's how it continued for many years. This is another slide of 2010, where again, the growth is beyond uh, 1604 North. And now if we, were, if we were to see one today, we would see uh, a lot of growth uh, past 1604 and 281, uh, creating a lot of problems. Uh, it's important also to note that this growth, uh, there's a whole story that I have on how this growth occurred. And a lot of it was public policy that placed 
economic generators like the medical center, like UTSA, like Fiesta Texas that drove the, the development north. Around 2008, on or about, city leaders supported by the business community started looking for revitalization of the inner city. And it makes sense. Among the benefits of redevelopment in an area where public infrastructure exists, they felt uh, they wanted to concentrate here. And also, it would be good for the Edwards Aquifer, perhaps reduce the stress. Uh, and we had been having this problem for so many years. But some major policy decisions were made on or about 2008, which have made a huge difference. City leaders, instead of just wishing that re revitalization and redevelopment would occur inside Loop 410, actually put its resources into the effort. Incentives make all the difference. An example of this new commitment is the inner city reinvestment infill, infill policy or ACRIP. And it's the policy of the city of San Antonio to promote growth and development in the heart of the city, specifically in areas that are currently served by infrastructure and transit, but underserved by residential and commercial real estate. And to accomplish the objectives of this ICRIP, the entire range of public incentives uh, is provided under this policy, including regulatory, which is zoning, board of adjustment, and so on, procedural, and the staffing of it, and financial incentives, even outright grants. Many of us did not realize that some of, some of what, what was being uh, made available, like ICRIB, was also, um, could also be used in our, in our neighborhoods. I thought it was the decade of downtown, and I assumed it was just downtown but it wasn't, it was touching our neighborhoods. In my opinion, problems that have arisen in recent months are due to the fact that while the areas of concentration for these programs are inside Loop 410, little attention has been given to the situation of the people who have been living in these areas for decades. As part of the development process, the question of how certain development will affect established neighborhoods and the people who have been living there for de decades is not asked. Um, the iCRIP service area is inside Loop 410. If you can see that circle, that's inside Loop 410. The dark areas are the service areas. This map is a map of, um, by Pew Research on the low income areas of San Antonio. They are in the areas where these incentives are being uh, provided. Uh, and, and Mayor, I do have to give you credit for all the work you did and have done as councilwoman in your district with uh, a lot of work. I wish we could extend that all over the city. Uh, so I thank you. Um, but there are huge areas in the west side that are in danger of disappearing because the housing is so old. Uh, there is uh, um, development, economic development, there are businesses that are being set in corridors like Culebra, <coughs> and the neighborhoods next to them are in danger. They're small, they're vulnerable, and there's no plan to what is going to be done, for example, with West End at the corner of Sarsamora and Culebra. I'm very worried about that. Uh, the Mission Trail zoning case has been the most glaring example of how the construction of high-end apartments meant the displacement of longtime residents. This would never have occurred if we had proper policies to address the needs of longtime inner city residents and their neighborhoods. In this case, about 300 people lost their homes. Most owned their homes. Today, some of those families are living doubled up in other people's homes, and they have been rendered homeless. We need to do something about that. People are being displaced. Our city is growing. It will continue to grow. And I am very proud that Mayor Castro appointed a committee, a task force to deal with these issues. I was appointed to it, so was Dr. Drennan, and of course we're going to be giving our report to Mayor Taylor, so you've got three people here. Uh, and I look forward to doing some serious work, and I invite particularly the students here, if you want to give me your name, so I will, will put you on an email to report to you what you're doing, and the day that we have a, a, a hearing, uh, to hear what you have to say, that you come and you report to the task force. Well, this I'll close, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Maria. Dr. Christine Drennan has been doing some incredible, incredible work on, on neighborhoods and, and, and young people and poverty education. 
She is the director of the Urban Studies Program at, at Trinity University. Dr. Drennan served as the research partner on the Promise Neighborhood Planning Effort and is currently the research director of the Choice Neighborhood Initiative and the Byrne Criminal Justice Initiative, three federally funded projects geared to revitalizing San Antonio's east side neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods have the highest poverty rates, lowest educational attainment rates, and highest recidivism rates in the city. In that capacity, she is responsible for community engagement, data collection and analysis, and project impact assessment, ensuring that resident voices are represented in these neighborhood revitalization efforts. Recently, her work revealed the strong correlation between pre-K attendance and later success in school, and led to the creation of additional pre-K sites. Her findings on the lack of social services and amenities in the area resulted in the designation of the local middle school as a community school by the school district. Additional engagement in the neighborhood with youth on probation revealed that issues as simple as transportation caused many to miss their appointments with probation officials, thus violating probation and often having it revoked. With presentation of these findings to the probation department, police department, housing authority, and city officials resulted in proposed strategies to place probation officers in the neighborhood for increased access. Dr. Drennan received an MA in Geography from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a PhD in Geography at the University of Texas Austin. She serves on the board of the L. Austin Community Center and the Alamo Community Group, an affordable housing provider. She has served as an expert witness for MALDEF. And finally, she has published most recently in Geographical Review and Journal of Geography in Higher Education. Dr. Christine Drennan. here from Trinity, so as you would be. <laughs> it's nice to be here. The lights are very disorienting. Yeah. And I tend to walk, well, I tend to walk a lot, so, um, so I, I, I may be up and down. What I'm presenting tonight, I don't know if I'm on. Am I on? Yeah, I think they're here. Okay, now I'm on. Um, what I'm going to present tonight is some work that I w have, some, some research that I've been doing with, us, with some students of mine at Trinity on, uh, on gentrification, but more largely on the housing situation in San Antonio. It started as a gentrification question and quickly became something else. I am gonna, I know I can feel it already, slide into teaching mode, and I'm sorry about that. It's just kind of, it's just how, how I kind of work. Um, the purpose of the study that I'm gonna present to you was really to look critically at that word, for one thing. Um, and to be, to be very careful with the vocabulary, because we toss around the word a lot, even in the newspaper tosses around the word a lot, and we you know, like get very upset about the word. Um, so to, so to, to consider the word, look at a couple of the definitions, like we heard from the councilwoman, and then, and then to test them out a little bit, because, because even, the pro, even the definitions are a little bit problematic. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Um, the word itself, right, what is this? Is that, is that this definition of gentrification has evolved since really the 1960s, 1970s when it was identified as a process actually in London. Um, over time it's come to incorporate more and more characteristics and indicators. Early definitions often referred to it as restoration, just of, 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 of deteriorating 18th, 19th century, often manufacturing or industrial buildings conversion of factories and warehouses to lofts, seeing a lot of that conversion, which was uh, uh, maybe have started um, by some what we would today call urban pioneers, a highly problematic term. We can talk about it if you want to. But, uh, but so artists might have moved in, young business people might have moved in, which gave the signal to others that it was okay to move in, followed by the middle, middle and upper classes. And with that, these new cultural amenities, designer shops, yoga studios, um, coffee shops, restaurants, and then, and then with that, the entire transformation of the neighborhood. And through the process, prices go up significantly. The definition actually that's really accepted today is kind of the standard comes out of the Brookings Institute, and I wanna look at it. Um, because it is the definition, the working definition most people use, right? So it's the process by which, and the italics, the italics are important, 
Higher income households displace lower income residents of a neighborhood, changing essential character and flavor of that neighborhood, so blah, 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 right? I can, this, this is the standard definition. Um, Brookings Institute, who, I, the, the, the displacement to me marks it as a very conservative definition, meaning this is, you know, that's, that's the extreme. Once we get to displacement and people are actually losing homes like we heard about, that's an extreme, you know, and so, so just to be aware that can we, and to question, can we have, dis, have gentrification even in those, in those steps prior to that without actual displacement? You know, do we have to only get alarmed when we get all the way to the, to the end of the process? So this is some of the questions that we were asking when we began this study, is that really do we have to get that far? Just a couple, you know, some of the cities around the country, a friend of mine actually just sent this, this, this place, do I have a pointer? No. <laughs> no, no, I don't. Um, so this place, this place that, I, that I actually right here just was listed. This is in, in, in New Orleans where the gentr gentrification and displacement are absolutely scary. This place right here was just listed for $500,000, right? $500,000. And uh, the, the, around the corner, doo -doo -doo, this little house right here, Kind of personal, but my son bought that house last year for seventy thousand dollars. Gentrification in New Orleans is a scary thing, and so just watching the process here in San Antonio and for us to try to get ahead of it a little bit is really important when you do see you know evidence of it like that in other cities. So what we've tr what we're trying to do here is to look at the process itself before we get to that displacement dis the, to the displacement step of it, because that's alarming. And can't, if we can understand the process and who's involved and, what's, and why it's happening, then policy can follow that. Because only if we understand process can we, can we try to create policy that gets it in, the, in, some of those, in some of those earlier stages. So what we need to do first is really to try to understand it. Here comes the, here comes the school part, ready? Um, neighborhoods change, right, neighborhoods change. That fact of life, we change, neighborhoods change, right? There's, reg there's regular neighborhood changes. This has been theorized since really the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. It's all over the economics literature. Neighborhoods change, right? There's even a little curve. Houses are developed. They're populated by families. But then new houses are often developed a little further out from the, central, from, from, from the center of town, right? The next neighborhood out gets built. Families that are a little bit wealthier may hop from that original neighborhood to the next neighborhood out. And their old house is often then bought by a younger family, possibly often making relatively less money, right? And so through that process, we say that that house filters down and there's a succession of families that move through it. And if housing has a, has a lifespan of 75 to 80 years without significant rehab, it goes through this process, right? So we have that development stage, new housing, kind of at the edge of town, new families move in. That stability stage, new families are there, children are, are raised. In that filtering stage, those families often, now, by now, financially successful and stable, may move out, may move out a little bit further to a newer and more expensive house, American Dream. Right? And then their old house filters and you know, just kind of the academic literature filters down to a younger family, which is maybe making less money. Ultimately, through that process, again theorized in the literature and pretty much in daily life, that the, the, the older houses with time and with inheritance may pass into rentership and then they're, and then they're not maintained as well. Finally, at the end of the stage, we get into what we call that abandonment stage or where that curve starts to shoot up with rehab, right? That's, that's highly theorized in the literature and actually we can see that almost in daily life. So if we look, if we kind of accept that model, what we're going to do when we think about things like gentrification is look for anomalies in this. Is something odd happening in what we expect in terms of just, is in terms of the neighborhood, its neighborhood life cycle. Right? So this is what, what our study was, was asking some of these questions. And could something be, be happening with our housing market in San Antonio? And if it is, can we identify it? Can we measure it? And then if we're alarmed by it, what do we do about it? 
So here we go, right? So this study, the study that we conducted at Trinity, really only looked at the inner city um, for a lot of different reasons. Students, you know what I'm talking about. For statistical reasons, I have to hold a lot of things constant, school districts, center, you know, distance from the center of town, all of those kinds of things. So we're really only looking inside 410. Um, we looked at 138 census tracts, which are our best abbreviation for a neighborhood. We looked only, the years are a little bit problematic, and I'll put this right out there. We looked at between 2000, 2003 and 2006. For data purposes and statistical purposes, we needed a wide range, because some, in some neighborhoods, you only get a couple of houses for sale in a year, and that's going to skew your results. Also, 2008 is highly problematic in the housing market. Right? And we've, we're still recovering from it. So we had to go beyond, before or after it. After it, there's not enough data, so we had to go before. Right? So, uh, so I'll just put that out there is that this, this is a little bit dated, but, it, but, but still, I think, interesting. So, so first of all, so, so if we just look at housing price and housing sales, are, are there areas in our city, inside 410, where the housing prices are going up at a higher rate than what we would expect? That's our first question, right? And what we found is that there's 35, 35 of those, uh, of those 138 census tracts that are experiencing housing prices in the top 15% of the county's rate of increase. They're colored here, right? 35 census tracts, 35 neighborhoods. But in some of these areas, it's actually even faster, right? And there's a couple of areas Sorry about the difficulty in seeing that, but I will talk about it. In some of those areas, it's really interesting, and this is the areas we focus on. Two, two, two of these neighborhoods, or census tracts, had consistently higher prices over those, over those years. One of them was around Lavaca, and one of them is the area just south of Lavaca. Three of these census tracts had prices, sales, home sales prices that moved from the, from the lower half of the county average Right, from the below the county mean to above it in that time range. That's really quick. Right? That's Tobin Hill, Beacon Hill, and the area north of the quarry. Those are the, those, so those are the areas that we really focus on in here. So we do see, we do, so first question was, yeah, we do see some anomalies in housing in some of those areas. So what else do we see? That's the price thing. But is there, are there other things? So some, some of the findings here in all of these census tracts, where the house price is increasing faster than that of the county, because you know in the perfect world, everything would go up at the same rate, just about, right? But we see some that are going up higher. So we, do we see socioeconomic changes? Do we see changes in the people? Not just in the housing, but in the people, in the population, right? So in those 35 neighborhoods, a couple of changes that we see, educational attainment. Is increase is, is higher, and it's going up at a, as, at a rate that's higher. For example, the number of people who have a bachelor's degree or the number of people who have, who have some kind of advanced degree. That is going up higher than in the county itself. The median income hasn't changed, hasn't changed statistically. It's not, it's not statistically significant. It's not, it's not higher in a significant way. Interesting point that we can talk about. Percentage homeowner has actually gone down, probably due to the number of new, new condominiums downtown, right? Because they're folded into some of that data. Um, if we look just at those census tracts, that was at the big 35, right? If we look just at the census tracts that I pulled out as being really interesting, educational attainment is way high. It's much higher than that in the county, and it's w much higher. It's increasing at a much higher rate than, it, than in the rest of the loop 410, inside 410, right? Median household income is also going up, it's, but, it's only, but it's going up at the rate of the entire county. It's going up higher than the inner city, but at but about the same rate as the entire county. Percent homeowner, again, in some of these areas is a little lower, but because we've got a lot of building right now in condominiums. So, we got some socioeconomic changes, right? So we got some home, we got some home price changes, we also got some socioeconomic changes, but what else? Another interesting thing is investment. Is investment being made in these neighborhoods? And, it, and how is it being made? In multiple periods, and these actually, these graphs are reversed, 
Um, there's increases in home sales price, like I talked about. That's the one on this side. I don't know my, know my left or my right. Not the farther one. Percentage incre there's increases in home sale price, right? But there's decreases in mortgage investment. That's weird, right? So I've got higher prices, but I do have a decrease in, in, in mortgage investment. This may suggest cash sales prices. Cash sales prices could be problematic because that's, that it could, it could be a real sign of speculation. You know, folks or small, farm, or small, small groups or whatever we want to call them, buying, uh, buying up houses. You've seen the, this, the signs. We buy ugly house or buy like all of those. Could be some of that going on. It's just something, it's, it's an interesting finding and something to watch. Is it speculators with organized funds making multiple home purchases in some areas? So this investment data is very interesting and could be really telling. So really it asks the question about who are the folks that are buying some of these houses? And, and actually, are they even people? Or are they just like funds somewhere? So this is another, you know, following up on that question, well, what kind of mortgages? If people are getting mortgages, we, are, we, we already know, OK, we got a lot of cash, we got a lot of cash sales. No mortgages on file. But if somebody is taking a mortgage, what kind of mortgage is it, right? Is it a conventional mortgage or an FHA mortgage? FHA mortgages, as some of you know, some of you don't. Interesting, you know, interesting thing. FHA mortgages tend to be first home, first time home buyers, right? They're they're, they're conservative mortgages. They're, they're, it's when you know the banks are really taking a little bit of a risk because you're a first time home buyer. What we find here is that the number of FHA loans has increased significantly since 2008. Before then, we had more conventional loans. That's people like me buying a house, second or your second or third house. But what we're seeing now since 2008 is more and more FHA mortgages, signaling those young families. Young families, highly educated. What we saw in that previous data, this is kind of corresponding to that, to tell us, OK, yeah, we may have an influx here of younger families not necessarily making more money, but highly educated. Right, that are moving into some of our inner city neighborhoods. So we got two different groups probably at work here. We got some cash stuff going on and something to really watch out for, but we also got younger families moving into our inner city neighborhoods. So different things. Uh, let's see. Um, so I want to return to this idea of this model, right? This, the, the, the model in the neighborhood in, in the neighborhood a life cycle. Right? And, we're, and right now, actually, you know, the, the, the time I'm talking about is right at the very end, land use succession, or, or are we in abandonment? And the gentrification thing is this land use succession, where the curve may be going up again, and the cycle starts again. Um, and if so, housing is actually getting pulled out right, of that housing life cycle. It had filtered down. It had probably housed people as renters of a lower income value. Just through, the, just through this process. Um, and, because the, and because housing neighborhoods change, right? But the thing is, we've pulled that housing out now, and we're starting the process again. What that, what that means, though, is that housing that had become affordable now starts the process again, right? So when we know that from this study, 35 of our inner city neighborhoods, something like that is happening. The big question, though, to me, and that I think comes out of that, is that was 35 neighborhoods out of 138. Remember, I started with 138. I said housing prices are going way up in 35. That leaves what? 103, right? In 103 of our inner city neighborhoods, that's not happening, right? In those neighborhoods, this housing life cycle, we're still on the curve meaning that that housing is still in the deterioration phase. So we're actually losing affordable housing for that income bracket in two ways, through, through deterioration, but also po possibly through this kind of revitalization that might be happening. That is really the bigger, uh, to, uh, to me, that's the big question here is that is the loss really of affordable housing in a couple of different ways. We could be losing this working class housing stock to deterioration and deferred maintenance. We may be losing some to gentrification, yes, but we're losing it also to this deterioration. 
So, just in closing, these 35 tracks we have identified as potentially gentrifying and, that, and, and pulling some working class housing in, out of that kind of housing stock into a non-working class bracket. And that's the potential loss of housing. But what about all the rest of it is the big question here, right? And in those census tracts, we do have, they're highly occupied by renters, right? A very vulnerable population with a low educational attainment, right? And a higher poverty rate than other places. So where, the, so the question is, is if we lose some of that affordable housing, and we're allowing the rest of it to further deteriorate, where do those folks go? Right? And the bigger question then is, is it, is it just a question of losing some to gentrification, or are we allowing the entire housing stock to actually deteriorate without, without maintenance? So, so far, I think some of, the, some of the loss to gentrification may be minimal. It's hard to, it's really, hard, it is a hard thing to measure, but we've got to consider the larger picture of the inventory of affordable housing. And that inventory, we come at it a couple of different ways. We have some affordable housing developers who actually build this stuff. But we also have just, we, we, we also have with this, this housing that filters down, that, that, that first time families are often living in. But that's what's deteriorating right now. And are we at risk of losing a lot of it? So this is the work that we've been involved in over across town. It's, it's kind of the, the academic side of the stories that we heard from the councilwoman. Um, but trying to understand like, the process so that we can figure out, like, do we have a problem? Can we describe the problem? Can we measure the problem? And then if we agree as, as, as a community that we do, what do we, what do we do about it? And that's when we pass to city government. <laughs> Nice hand off, Christine. Thank you very much. <laughs> now for the boss. <coughs> Born in Bro Brooklyn and raised in Queens, Ivy R. Taylor is a lecturer at UCSA in the Public Administration Department. She received a bachelor's degree in American Studies from Yale University in 1992 and master's degree in City and Regional Planning from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1998. She began her career working for the City of San Antonio in the Housing and Community Development Department in the Neighborhood Action Department. While at the city, she worked with a variety of neighborhood associations, developers, and nonprofit organizations in order to facilitate inner city redevelopment. She also planned several of the city's housing summits, which provided an opportunity for community partners to exchange practical ideas on how to address our city's housing needs. After six years, she left employment with the city of San Antonio to become vice president of Merced Housing, Texas. At Merced, she worked to create and implement programs focused on children, education, health, and financial literacy for apartment community residents. In, in 2009, she was elected to the San Antonio City Council, representing District 2, and re-elected in 2011 and 2013. This past summer, on July 22nd, she was appointed mayor by her city council colleagues to complete the unexpired term of Julian Castro becoming San Antonio's first African-American mayor, its second female mayor, and I believe Henry Cisnells was the first one to point this out, the first female African-American mayor of an American city with more than one million people. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Carrie, and good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me? I'm on. Okay, well, I'm so excited to have the opportunity to participate in this panel. As Carrie mentioned, we talked about it a few months back. And so it's, I think it's great timing because we have continued to talk about and face these issues here in San Antonio. And as uh, Ms. Berrio Sabo pointed out, we are working through a committee structure to determine how we can um, outlined some policies that would help us to deal with these changes in a more consistent fashion. So I have a few slides here today. I'm also going to try not to be too professorial. As Carrie mentioned, I'm a lecturer at UTSA. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually, uh, we didn't coordinate, but a couple of my slides correlate to some of the things that uh, Dr. Drennan had already mentioned. So let's go ahead and get started here. OK, so first, I had this slide up here 
uh, with just a few photos to tell you a little bit about me, which Carrie talked about. But I think it's important because I think a person's background, where they grew up, the key institutions that kind of shape their thinking influence how they approach issues like inner city redevelopment, where they want to live and how they want to live, and uh, public policy issues like dealing with gentrification. So these are some of the key, key points about me that help shape uh, where I am today. So here we go. This is the part that's a little professorial. But I wanted to take a step back kind of a little bit in contrast to the other presentations and put it in a larger context that's not just focused on San Antonio, but where I think San Antonio mirrors what we see throughout the nation, which is really about our housing history here and housing policy, with the key fact being that it's a market-based system that drives us. So housing availability here is largely market-based and housing production and consumption fuels a large part of our economy. I was meeting with some folks in the real estate industry today and all they could talk about was housing starts, housing starts, housing starts, and how that impacts job growth and other other things here uh, in our city. So housing is definitely big business. And so even though shelter, we're talking about shelter, is a common human need in a market-based system, affordable shelter is unfortunately going to be less desirable. Substandard or located near nuisances or in many uh, instances overcrowded. And so looking back a little bit on our history uh, as a nation, as, as our urban centers throughout the U.S. expanded, older neighborhoods became less desirable due to market forces, which were also aided by federal policies. Let's not forget about redlining and other uh, things that helped to aid that decline. And so we had some reform-minded folks that came in and also some profit-minded developers that pushed for slum clearance and resettlement. So thus we had programs like Urban Renewal and Hope Six and some others. And throughout that time period of the past 100 years, the American dream that we've all come to you know, believe in has, has been a central strategy related to building wealth, that American dream of home ownership. So it was seen as a central component for community development and necessary for community stability because homeowners were thought to be invested in a community in a way that renters were not. Now, I've always had a little bit of difficulty with that concept as someone who grew up in New York City, and there were a lot of people who were renters. My grandmother rented her apartment for about 30 years, and so she was very vested in what was happening in that neighborhood. But these ideas about the American dream are really embodied in policy in many ways. For example, the single largest housing subsidy in the U.S. is the home mortgage deduction. So I think a lot of times we don't frame the home mortgage deduction as a subsidy, and oftentimes we point the finger at people who are receiving other types of housing subsidies, but that is a subsidy. So this, this issue of gentrification is a result of conflict between the forces of the housing market and our public policy. So as um, the other speakers have done as well, I wanted to take a moment to define gentrification. Sometimes I just say the G word. I don't like to say <laughs> gentrification because depending on who you're talking to, it means one thing or the other. Mm -hmm. Some people think, refer to it as positive. Oh, that area is really gentrifying, it, like, right. meaning it's improving. And then for other people, oh, gentrification means 300 people lo lost their homes. But these are, some, these are some of the things that I think of when I think about uh, gentrification. The first is rapid, a rapid increase in neighborhood desirability and real estate values due to market or policy impact. So whatever is happening is happening pretty quickly, a little bit outside of the norm. Second, escalating prices, taxes, and rents displace residential and commercial. Let's not forget about the commercial side as well tenants and owners, and then uh, going back to that commercial side, there could be a change in the business mix in commercial districts because some of those neighborhood-based people that have been there forever, they can no longer afford the rents uh, in the area, so then you'll see a different mix of, uh, of vendors and products in the commercial districts. So okay, following up with where <laughs> Dr. Drennan left off, here's a nice uh, chart for you on the life cycle of a neighborhood, which what she talked about as well, from suburb to de-gentrification. 
So as Dr. Drennan mentioned, almost every American neighborhood um, started out as a suburb and have periodic cycles of rise and decline, just like other types of investments. Think about the stock market. And so this slide illustrates what happens during a period of decline or degentrification, which literally refers to people leaving when prices fall and families are locked into mortgages, often owing more than a home is worth. We saw a lot of that here recently not uh, here in San Antonio, but in other places. And so a great deal of the housing stock just ends up being abandoned. And so many American cities and states have faced this kind of situation during the past 10 years, uh, but there were previous housing bubbles as well, besides this most recent one. So the overall policy goal has been for housing prices to have a steady, gradual increase so that families can build wealth and neighborhoods are stable. But obviously, this doesn't always happen. Prices can increase rapidly and they can also decrease rapidly or otherwise, and that often leads to periods of displacement. And so worth noting is that integration of neighborhoods had a similar impact on neighborhoods, although the mechanism was different. Minority families moving in depressed, pro moving in depressed property values, uh, although much of this impact was due to the illegal practices of blockbusting, but we still end up with the same result, which is a loss of property value and the loss of the investment by those families. So how do we get to the point where we can have neighborhoods for all? Well, there, are, there have been some interventions in housing markets, and they have a mixed record. Uh, we've attempted, well, I, first let me speak on the positive side. Some of the regulatory standards that we've put in place have drastically increase the safety and comfort of, of, of people throughout uh, the United States. Because think about it, in the early uh, 20th century, many people lived in homes that didn't have running water, that didn't have a connection to water and sewage. In fact, when I worked at Merced Housing Texas, in, and I went to that job in 2004, we, Merced was actually working on connecting some homes down by the mission to sewer. In the, in, you know, in the uh, 21st century. So um, we have had you know, dramatic increases in safety and quality as a result of some of our regulatory standards. So now people have indoor plumbing and electricity, but that doesn't help us increase supply. In some other cities, like my um, hometown where I was born of uh, New York, we had rent control there, uh, and that's been criticized from the right and the left for reducing investment in housing and causing more inflation. And I've got some stories of some units that I've seen go through hands of families that I knew, oh, we're saving for a house, so we're just gonna move into Auntie so-and-so had this rent control unit, we'll live there for five years, and then we'll let the next family member live there. I don't think that was really the original intention of the program. So rent control has reduced the total number of units on the market. Uh, it does provide some affordable units, but not like, you know, more access. It, it, it can reduce access to affordable units. And then, of course, large-scale public housing is um, the other major investment that's been made throughout our nation. Uh, but there have been notable failures, and um, but there have also been notable successes in relation to public housing. We talked about that the other day when I was at the ceremony where we were celebrating that we were tearing down Wheatley Courts over on the east side. And I reminded people that at a certain point in history, Wheatley Courts represented progress for some of the families that were moving in because they were moving from substandard housing to places that were uh, a lot more uh, safe and secure. Of course, over the years, that changed. And public housing tends to, uh, well, by design, uh, it focuses on those that are at the very lowest end of the spectrum. And so it doesn't capture some of those other folks that are uh, vulnerable. But let's get to one of the real issues that we're talking about. Before I talk briefly about what some of the local solutions can be for this uh, kind of mi mi uh, m mismatch, I think that's the word I'm trying to say, between uh, the, the market and uh, our policies. One of the real issues is uh, income inequality. That's one of the structural issues that's underlying all these tensions related to 
uh, neighborhood change, neighborhood decline, whether or not uh, people should look at home ownership as the single most biggest investment uh, for their families. We've had a surge in income inequality. And what that means is that middle and low income families are increasingly priced out of the housing market or have to invest a much larger portion of their income in housing. And so when the downturns come, like the recent one that we just experienced, they're very vulnerable and have no cushion. So the chart on the right shows that since 1980, annual after-tax income has flatlined for low and middle income families. And as the chart on the left shows, incomes have been going down while costs are going up. This is of course not news to many of you and it's the focus of a lot of activism right now. But this is to some extent a global issue, but the United States is in pretty bad shape um, in comparison to some other economies on, on this measure as well. I know um, in some of the periodicals that I read, I get Essence and Ebony and some of those magazines, and I've read a lot about how which those magazines focus on African Americans, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, articles about how African Americans lost so much wealth during the recent downturn in the economy because they tend to be more in that you know middle range that's more vulnerable, and then as their homes lost value, it really was a significant decrease in overall wealth for that particular ethnic group. But I'm sure um, that would apply to to other groups as well. But in general, the issue is the people that are in the middle and lower. Uh, spectrum on the economic ladder are, of course, more vulnerable to these bubbles in the housing market when we continue to promote uh, the fact that they should you know, put all their eggs in the home ownership basket. Now, I'm not going to sit here and try and debate that home ownership is, is bad because, I mean, there have been numerous studies that have proved you know, the positive uh, effects of, of uh, home ownership. I'm just putting this data out here for you at, you know, for us to all think about. So in relation to trying to minimize the impact of uh, these neighborhood life cycles and bubbles that can occur in the housing market, well, I'm a community development planner, so I think community development works. And so that refers to approaches that support residents and stabilize deteriorating neighborhoods. So instead of just focusing on the housing, let's also talk about the people, right? So let's figure out how can we create ladders of opportunity for people who are already in neighborhoods that are vulnerable so that they can improve their educational attainment, uh, so that they can improve their job status and develop more financial stability so that they can earn, they can obtain jobs where they can earn enough money to then be able to invest in the homes that they live in so that those homes won't have to continue to uh, deteriorate and uh, decline in value. And so uh, I think this is a best practice. This is a strategy that we've been employing on the east side in the area that we refer to as East Point. As was mentioned, we have uh, done a lot of work to garner a large number of uh, investments into East San Antonio, but we're not just focused on housing. So the Housing Authority has one component, and yes, they are going to tear down and rebuild Wheatley Courts, and we'll have some really nice new apartments there that will be mixed income. Uh, they'll also be working on improving the housing, the single-family housing stock that's nearby. Uh, but we're also working on education um, for the area so that the kids that are going to school in that area will have better outcomes. We're also working on uh, trying to get residents who are already there jobs and increase their skills. We're also working on improving the commercial corridors nearby so that people who are, have a little more disposable income won't feel like they have to leave the area because I want to live someplace where I can have access, easier access to retail and the kind of amenities that people in the suburbs enjoy. So also my work at Merced Housing Texas was focused in this area. So we provided affordable uh, apartment units for low income residents, but we didn't just stop there. We worked on bringing in community partners that could assist the residents with increasing their educational attainment, with achieving financial stability, with improving their health, 
you know, with all the things that could help them to live more stable lives. So I think um, that was, uh, was a great example and is a great example of approach. Here, for our city, citywide, we're taking that approach with the Pre-K for SA program, right? We're focused on making investments early on in our, our smallest, most vulnerable citizens so that um, they can enter kindergarten prepared to learn and then go through the, the educational system here in a successful fashion so that they will be um, assets to the neighborhoods where they live. And then um, finally, at the same time, we're also working on a comprehensive uh, planning process for our city to, so that we can have a master plan that articulates a vision for a city where all parts of San Antonio would grow and thrive. So it's not just about consistently annexing and growing in certain areas and leaving those um, other areas behind uh, to just be vulnerable to that neighborhood decline process, but instead so that we can uh, have the data that's necessary for us to create policies that would facilitate investment in those parts of town that are, are vulnerable. And that some of the data that would help us to do that is kind of having a good sense of where much of the uh, potential is for, for uh, investments to take off. Where, where are some of the employment centers already where we could uh, create um, uh, areas of town where it's not just, okay, this isn't just where people go to work, but this is also an area where we have neighborhoods and we have commercial, and that creates a, a stronger quality of life. And if you have uh, a mixed income community there, then that makes it better for everyone. One of the challenges we had on the east side was that a lot of people complained, well, there's, there's no place, there are very few employment options, you know, as far as large employers in this side of town. Um, and people had problems related to transportation as far as them getting to some of the major employment centers in town. So we think an approach that recognizes we have assets spread throughout town, um, combined with uh, sensitive housing plans that would allow people to live near those places is the way to go so that we can, um, we can have balanced growth throughout the city. So, um, that is all I have for you today, but I hope that that helped to, to add to the conversation and pose some questions about some of the uh, assumptions that we all make related to where and how people live and can push us in the direction of developing policies, at least here on the local level, that can uh, minimize the conflicts that we are seeing played out as uh, some areas you know, are being invested in, but really at the end of the day, we can't just invest in real estate, we also have to invest in people. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you all for your great presentations. Um, at this point, we have some time for for, for questions, we have the, uh, the graduate students in the Red Church, I believe the ones who are going to, to go around with the wireless microphone and uh, just ask you to keep your questions succinct and uh, yeah. there's the first one right here. Uh, oh, you want me to talk into it? Hi. Um, my name is Cher Gonzalez Menchaca. I'm a 12th generation Roman Catholic Pecana. I'm also a, um, I spent my junior year here in St. Mary's University. I uh, came back in the mid 80s to be a, a part of their um, administrative staff. And as an aunt of five beautiful grand nephews, you bet your bottom dollar, I have a vested interest in the city of San Antonio, especially in development. Uh, Mayor Taylor, if you go down to the uh, plaque in the back of the city hall, you'll see some and Chaka people listed there. Okay. Um, I noticed that um, we, at St. Mary's University, is a Catholic, and I can guarantee you that when I left St. Mary's here and returned to Loyola, Chicago, for my degree um, finalization plan, um, I was already very much exposed to the Catholic Church's social justice teaching, beginning with Pope Leo XIII encyclical verum novarum um, 
Gentrification is just one aspect of that. My question is, and none of you mentioned is, how to protect the residents of those areas which are being taken over by either investors or even if they're younger families, if there can be some sort of either financial backing to guarantee that those residents are able to remain in their neighborhoods. I think that really is a, uh, a, a matter of justice, mm -hmm. a matter of fairness, and certainly uh, uh, from a very human uh, interest, human side, that uh, we are to treat our brothers and sisters who are to care for them. We are our, our uh, community members keepers. And I wish either of any one of you could address that concern of mine. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I guess I would say that we are, uh, right now through this committee, I think we're going to be examining what are the options for us as far as you know providing assistance or having some kind of uh, consistent framework for dealing with those uh, types of situations. But I also have to say that I am supportive of growth and investment in the inner city, and I was supportive of the project um, uh, in the uh, in District Three that unfortunately displaced uh, the folks that were living there because I feel like certain parts of town get characterized as well, you know, that area is not going to have a nice new apartment complex where if younger people think about some of the younger people who grew up in stable homes and went to St. Mary's and then they want to live in their neighborhood, they're not ready to buy a house. That, apart, that apartment complex could provide an opportunity for them uh, for uh, nice housing. So I, I definitely think we have to have a balance. I want to find that balance uh, because I do believe in obviously treating people uh, with dignity and respect. But uh, we have to also, to a certain extent, embrace some of those changes. I think there are some things that we already do you know, as far as tax exemptions for, for, for the elderly. And also in our historic districts, we also have some uh, tax exemption program, but it's only for city taxes. I'd love to get some of the other taxing entities uh, to sign on to that, where if you invest in a home, you, your property taxes are frozen. So those are some of the things that I think maybe we could do more of. You know, uh, uh, Sherry? and I know your history. Uh, speaking of, of social justice, I don't know how many of you know Father Bill Davis, uh, the oblate. He told me a story when I had first gotten to city council and we were, we were working on some issues. And he said, we can do our work of justice in two ways. One of them is to um, uh, you know, help people with the needs that they have, immediate needs, and that's their, their shelter and their housing and uh, uh, their food, health issues, but we can also do systemic things, and that's to change the system. Mm -hmm. And what I have chosen to do with my life, uh, all my life, uh, is to work at changing the system. And that is really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, where San Antonio is right now, uh, if we see the history for the past um, 50 years for sure, is that I see uh, visions of, uh, of changing the course of this ship that has been going one way, getting direction from the very wealthy in this city, and if it's good for them, it's done, and if it's not good for them, it doesn't get done. And I'm very tired of that. Uh, but I see, like, we're beginning to actually talk about things like that, and that's important. Uh, somebody sent me, I'm getting so much stuff since I started talking about gentrification. One of them is this study that was done in the Bay Area uh, uh, I think I mentioned it, uh, and it says resisting gentrification in the Bay Area. At the end, they have uh, some recommendations of things that can be done. One of them is inclusionary zoning, uh, Mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, something that if we had, which is systemic, uh, we would have uh, changed the, the issue of Mission Trails um, a bit, because what you do is you make sure that, a, that when the city is investing a lot of money, millions of dollars, in these uh, new developments, we insist, we exact uh, promises that they are going to provide a certain level of housing for the people. What if we were so um, uh, creative in the city that we could do what other, people's do, other people do, 
uh, create land banks where some of the people who live there who could actually who could have actually stayed there I mean is that so um, you know difficult uh, another thing that they um, that they really uh, want and this we should have been doing a long time ago and that is uh, investing in rehabilitation uh, helping people keep up their homes um, another one is uh, master planning making sure we have a plan <coughs> the last time we tried it was in the 1970s and we got uh, mayor to the very end and then the big forces came in and they didn't want us to be telling them what to do so master planning and I really you know celebrate that you're talking about that um, another thing is to invest in longtime residents in, um, in in communities what uh, Charlie um, president uh, <laughs> Dr. Cattrall uh, <laughs> <laughs> we talked about the suggestion that, that you had when I spoke to your class about gentrification, and that is having some kind of tax structure. So when the taxes are going up in a certain community, we help the people who have been there the longest. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done, uh, and I think um, it's the, the will, <laughs> the political will to do it, and the, the help of the community to say enough is enough. San Antonio has to be a different city. Uh, we can fix entire neighborhoods. I have that hope. And that's what I'm hoping in this uh, task force that we have. And again, I plead all of you to be involved as much as you can in what we're doing. Yeah, just really quickly so that we can move on is um, housing is, I think housing might, is the only commodity that we purchase that actually at some point in our lives we probably can't afford anymore. Like my clothes deteriorate, my car deteriorates. <laughs> My stuff deteriorates. <laughs> My house appreciates. Yeah. And it just, it's, it just seems like a fundamental <laughs> right that if I bought it at one point, it can't. If I play the game and if I'm employed and I work, I can't get priced out of something I bought. Right? And that, it, that, that to me is fundamental. And, um, and is, you know, is there a way for some of these policies, especially policy as far as um, low interest, you know, low interest loans so that we can just keep up with infrastructure and things like that. But that's, oh, I'm gonna go on. Yeah, my name is Mark. I'm a graduate student here at St. Mary's. Um, I live in the 78254 area code, which has not yet been annexed by the city. Um, one of the things, uh, just an observation, uh, one of the things that I see that sets San Antonio apart from a lot of, basically from every other uh, major metropolitan area in the country is that we, San Antonio does not have any uh, surrounding municipalities that can support, um, that can support the, basically the issue of sprawling. Right, um, so you see, all, especially on the Northwest side, uh, I'm, you know, since I live there, I'll speak on that there's a major influx of people buying homes in that area because it's more appealing to be able to buy a, a brand new home in an area where you don't have to pay city taxes and at the same time if if, if uh, a married couple has kids they have the luxury of a new a brand new school or brand new schools being built elementary schools high schools right. um, in that area so uh, I guess you know, if you compare it to say like Houston or Dallas, you know, you have other municipalities that are surrounding these cities that that can address that issue. But um, I guess you mentioned incentives earlier, right? So what type what type of incentives can balance that out in in, in terms of making the city more appealing uh, or living within the city limits to where people can say yes, I'm, I'm paying city taxes, but I'm actually, I'm getting something in return for it as opposed to uh, living outside the city limits and not having to pay a city tax. Um, are there, I mean. Well. Thank you. I'm just gonna try not to jump on that too hard because you're kind of hitting a hot button issue for me here. <laughs> I was just telling my students the other day, I teach a class on urban management and policy and I was giving the scenario just that you explained because we were talking about our topic actually yesterday was on uh, services that local municipal governments provide. And I said a lot of people get sold on oh, I'm not getting, uh, I'm not paying city taxes, but guess what, you're also not getting city services. So, you know, when you move out into those areas, you may have a shiny new 
box that you live in uh, and a shiny new school that your kids go to, but there's no shiny new library. There's probably no park nearby. Uh, there's no, probably not a community center unless it's within your, uh, your subdivision. So um, I would say that living in the city is appealing because I live in the city, so <laughs> uh, I've got a young child at home. We live in a 103-year-old house on the Near East Side, and I think there are a lot of people who would find inner city living appealing if we could address some of the issues that are a result of neighborhood decline. So I think that's a lot of times what people are fleeing from, not just you know the ability to not have to pay um, city taxes, but if we could address some of, the, some of the issues that are a result of neighborhood decline, like crime, graffiti, uh, decrease in the, what, you know, the quality of what's happening at the school, which is correlated to the property tax revenue that the schools get, which goes back again to the decline. If we could find ways to address that and then also have some better marketing and some realtors who would actually take people to inner city instead of Stone Oak and SeaWorld, mm -hmm. um, which we love Stone Oak and SeaWorld. They're a part of San Antonio too, but San Antonio is a city that offers a wide range of options for people for living. And I think all that range should be presented to people uh, so that they can then make the best decision for their family and they won't have to feel like the only option is to move, you know, kind of to the, the outer edge or even outside of the city limits. You know, uh, I have uh, Al Kaufman sitting right in front of me, mm -hmm. and I think it would be um, not good uh, to mention the issue that he has been about uh, most of his life, and that is equality, equal funding uh, in public education. Because one of the reasons that people uh, move away from the uh, central city is because of the public school system. We had a, a, a woman who, uh, uh, a family that rehabilitated a house across the street from us uh, here in Beacon Hill. And when her little girl turned the age of school, she left. And she said, I, I'm, they, left for, they went to Bernie uh, because of the school and she loved the neighborhood. Uh, but that's something that we can do. And that is uh, work really hard to improve our educational system. The courts have already told us how many times that we need to do it and it's, it's beyond me how our legislature is still not able to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I was going to say the, the exact same thing, is that our, our school districts act like northern suburbs, you know, as far as that sorting of the population. So we have the suburban phenomenon, but it's actually the political geography of the, the yeah. school districts mm -hmm. rather than suburbs. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's going to be in order. That gentleman right there is going to be you, and there's three over here, so I see five right now. Good evening. My name is Brother Ralph Newman. I'm a Marianist brother. Uh, I live here on campus in the Marianist residence, and we've got some good Marianist friends here who come over to see us, and we appreciate having the students here very much. Um, I think the panelists is an excellent topic, and very necessary, your presentations. It's a people issue, very much so. Uh, five years ago, a former mayor of San Antonio, Hardberger, together with, I think, Mr. Grihi, conceived of a need for housing for people who live under the bridges and the people who are homeless and indigent in the very center of town. They can't go out to either north, south, east, or west. They are living there because that's where they are. And uh, at the Haven of Hope, they are able to make a progress and overcome their defections and their addictions and do a lot of, th begin a new life. Um, I would. I guess my question is, how is that related to the rest of the inner city? How is the haven of hope helping, hindering? Because <laughs> it's a touchy issue, I know. I'm sorry, but. Well, I might be best prepared to answer that since the city has been a key partner in Haven for Hope. So Haven for Her Hope definitely is a bright spot and a bright light for those folks who have managed to 
um, enter the program and go through the transitional, the transformational aspect through the help of a wide variety of wraparound services and then many of them are then able to re-enter the workforce and get back into stable housing and one of the things that Haven for Hope has been doing has been um, also to be part of that housing continuum so they have built some housing for people that are leaving Haven for Hope but I would say uh, while I think they've been incredibly helpful for, for those folks that there are still a lot of people that are vulnerable for a number of reasons. They may not be able to actually go through the transformation process due to, you know, severe mental health issues mm -hmm. or, or other issues. So, I mean, there are still some folks out there that are, that are struggling. And also, I guess, kind of looking at it from, on the flip side, if you think about the lack of affordable housing, that's what leads many families to end up being homeless mm -hmm. and then needing to kind of restart and go through the Haven for Hope to begin with. So I think if we had a uh, uh, larger supply of uh, affordable housing, that yeah. for some, some, some percentage of the population, they might never need to go through Haven to begin with. Um, thank you for speaking today. I did not intend on asking a question, but um, I can lend some advice because my family is a part of the gentrification. Um, it is happening in District 1, and um, I won't say what area or what, but uh, my grandmother who lived in this house, and excuse me if I get emotional, um, for 40 years I was raised in that house. Um, there was a gentleman that privately bought cash the houses in the neighborhood. Mm. And when he initially bought them, we rented the house from him at a reasonable price. But as the years went by, and I, I'm saying this over a three year period, the rent went up to over what a, a mortgage for a brand new house was. Mm. So I eventually had to move my grandmother with me mm. in, in a two bedroom house with my husband, myself and my son. So how do you, I mean, with the private investors, he literally, this gentleman literally bought up the entire street. How do you limit that or how do you um, help that or lend help to that? Because I'm all for growth. That neighborhood, that particular neighborhood was ready for growth. However, how do you regulate that? Because the revenue generated by that rent, and he actually turned that house into a duplex. So it was just, my rent was half, my grandmother's rent was half of it. How do you um, bring that revenue back to the neighborhood? Because it was just going into his privately funded pocket and he didn't even live in the neighborhood. His business was in the neighborhood, but he did not live in the neighborhood itself. <laughs> you have a very real issue and that is something that I have been very worried about, particularly in the neighborhood where I was raised. Uh, and that's what I call the Christ the King neighborhood. Uh, and, but it's not the only one. What happens is that there are people, and we don't know who, that is buying entire blocks. It's off West Martin Street, uh, 24th around there. They're buying huge um, blocks. And I don't know what's gonna happen there. Uh, my, my um, cynical mind uh, <laughs> says that what has to happen is eventually we're gonna need the Walmart and the Target right in the inner city. And that what they're doing is amassing all this land so that they can um, sell it uh, for good money to developers. Uh, so the only thing I can think of is that we need to ask the question again see because we're not asking the question we say economic development and we haven't even we don't even have a city consensus on what that is you know what is economic development in san antonio if you just put something there and say that's economic development is that going to help everybody no it may drive people away so i think the first thing that's not going to help your grandmother is for us as a community just to ask the question, what are we doing to the people who have been in these neighborhoods the longest? Just asking the question, because it may be we don't care. Okay, well, at least we answered it, right? Uh, 
but, but then we may say, well, why don't we put our, our, our heads together, which is what we're doing, um, Madam Mayor, and say, okay, what will we do? But the thing is, we can't forget the people that are right now losing their homes. Another example, and I'll keep talking about the corner of Sarsamor and Culebra, where there's gonna be a McDonald's and something else, and there's already a Walgreens. They tore down 15 residences, 15 families, and it was one man that bought the whole block. And then he sold it to McDonald's. So what's gonna happen to the next block? Okay, we've got three more questions. Well, we've got about four minutes and about four questions. Close enough. This, this, and that. Hi. Um, speaking, you mentioned growing up in Queens and how you don't really buy into the idea that renters aren't invested. And I'm of the millennial generation. I'm very passionate about the idea that you can buy into your community and you might not economically benefit from buying a home, even if you're raising kids and you're young. And I also don't want to live in a condo, frankly. But I do want to live in a nice community on the west side where I, it's mixed income and I feel as a young person that I could start a family and rent. And I'm thinking, in San Antonio, what are some um, ways that we can make that part of the culture? Because I'm always hearing that we want more people to start buying houses, more young families. And I don't think it's necessary or even economically sound for a lot of families to do mm -hmm. that. So um, this is mostly directed at the mayor, but anyone else? Well, I think one of the practical ways we could address that is by being more flexible in what we allow as far as development. And it's not anything new, but 100 years ago, it was, it was pretty common and popular in many of our San Antonio neighbors to have granny flats, which mm -hmm. is a smaller unit that's behind the main unit. And that can provide opportunities for a young single person or a small family to live and rent in a neighborhood. So I think looking at some of those options as well as uh, thinking more creatively about if we're doing infill development to allow for different types of housing to be built as opposed to just single family housing. Over uh, in my neighborhood in Dignity Hill, we had a developer come in. Now they're not for rent, but just as an example, he, he bought a tract of land and he built uh, 12 uh, they're, they're townhomes, but they're not attached. And so that provides a different housing option for, for people in that area. So I think just being kind of creative, but we have to provide, we have, we have to talk more about what it means to have some, something like that in the neighborhood and how it could look and how it can fit in. Because a lot of times people who've been owners for a long time, they get really nervous about the idea of something that doesn't look like their house being built in their neighborhood. So those are some practical suggestions. So I live in the Beacon Hill neighborhood along with Ms. Birio Zaval, mm -hmm. which is one of the neighborhoods, Ms. Drennan, that you called out as having the anomaly increase in housing prices. Do you have any thoughts as to what's creating that anomaly? In that one in particular, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. those neighborhoods, they, they, they share particular housing mm -hmm. stock, um, and, we would, and we could dive into that data to see, because I, get, I offered some generalizations. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cash sales. You see, so you see these cash sales, or you see FHA mortgages, meaning like two really different groups. Um, higher education rate, yet not a higher income rate. So um, we could, you know, we can look specifically at a couple of those, but yeah, mine were generalizations. Um, and again, you know, you've got that, you've got a housing stock that that is that started as a higher income mm -hmm. when it was originally built. It was higher income. The thing with the inner city San Antonio, so much of it was built. For, it was actually built as working class housing. Originally, when it was originally mm -hmm. built, it was working class housing. It's always been humble, it's mm -hmm. always been modest. And we're losing so much of that just through deterioration so that neighborhoods like that one that actually were built a little higher quality are, re are, are vulnerable to the process. Mm -hmm. you know, so we've got, we got a, a different housing stock than a lot of cities do. You know, because it's a little mm -hmm. bit newer. It's, it's a post-war housing mm -hmm. stock. It was built really, really quickly, really fast, and, and not of the quality of, of neighborhoods like yours. Yeah. So, so two, you know, two really vulnerable points right there. Okay, two more. You, well, three more. The one right there, then you, and this is gonna be the last one back here. Good afternoon. Um, my question is, or 
Can you talk about uh, or talk a little bit about the kinds of incentives and benefits that the city of San Antonio offers developers to come and revitalize and then compare that with the uh, current efforts being being made to ensure that these benefits are accessible and affordable to low income people? Well, I guess I well, let me start off with a disclaimer, which is that I started out my career focused on affordable housing. That was the main thing I was focused on. How can we create apartments that are going to be where there's going to be a subsidy so it's cheaper for people to live in? How can we um, provide opportunities for first time home buyers, some more modest homes for people to, to live in? What I found is that after years of the city focus, focusing on investing just in affordable housing in the inner city, that that did not help stop the cycle of decline in those neighborhoods. So for me personally, my focus has been on creating mix, mixed income neighborhoods, which means for in many cases, how can we bring a higher product and people that have more disposable income into these vulnerable neighborhoods? Because I think that's gonna create more opportunities for stability in the long term, mm -hmm. though it may create a little pain and discomfort in the short term. So we have a variety of incentives where we provide um, um, waivers re related to some of the fees for development. Uh, we also we provided uh, cash incentives to some of the housing developers. And one of the things that was developed during my time on council was instead of a project by project review process where it could get very political as to whether your project gets funding but your project doesn't get funding, we developed an as of right incentive program, which means if you meet these criteria, then you're gonna get these incentives. So that took a lot of the politics out of it and resulted in a lot of investment in uh, mainly apartments because our previous mayor was really focused on this decade of the downtown with one of the key components of creating a vibrant downtown of having more people actually living downtown. So he was very focused on how we could bring more housing. It, it has been uh, successful. Now I will say that I don't think we have been as strategic or creative in relation to that balance related to affordable housing because we've just been doing, I think we've focused on that single family dream. And so many of the folks that had been doing affordable housing for years, they were just building subdivisions where they're building a little three, two with hardy plank and carpet and formica. And that's gonna be comfortable for that family that's moving in. But when they decide to move out and move up, then who wants to move into 15 year old hardy plank and carpet mm -hmm. and uh, you, you see what I'm saying? So, uh, I don't think that we have been as creative as we need to be uh, and that we're starting to look at some ways that we could provide more balance. And I think some of the things that um, Ms. Barrio Zabo talked about, we really haven't even touched on like land trusts uh, because someone was saying something earlier. I think the young lady who was talking about her grandmother's situation, I do have to say that while I believe that renters play an important role in uh, can be vested in a neighborhood, if you want to control what happens to a piece of land, you have to own it. Right now, within the system in which we operate, ownership really is kind of the big chip. So if we could find ways to convey ownership mm -hmm. to people who have less means, then that could be an, a more creative way that we could you know, try to sh better strike that balance. If you uh, just Google ICRIP, San Antonio. You're going to get pages and pages of the kinds of assistance that developers are getting to create businesses and uh, apartments. It's not for single family. And one of the problems that we have in San Antonio that's historic, and I don't think we're unusual, is that we have not um, done much to promote and provide affordable housing except what we get with CDBG. Uh, which has been going down in, you know, every year. So uh, we depend on the federal government for the affordable housing, and that has been shrinking. So it's like, so we're going to have to create uh, programs uh, on our own locally, uh, like Austin. You know, Austin had a couple of bond issues for affordable housing. Like, can San Antonio do that? Can we build up a, uh, a demand in, in this city that we need to provide uh, money uh, bond issues for housing, whether it's housing rehabilitation, affordable housing, 
uh, whatever kind of housing. Uh, but go to iCrip because they get a lot of stuff. Second to last one. Uh, Saint, thank you to <laughs> St. Mary's and the panel for uh, being present and organizing this event. Uh, my concern is with the uh, nuisance of affordable housing in a market-based system uh, that Mayor Taylor uh, referred to, but this question is for all. Um, in looking at the Center City Development's Office uh, list of inner city um, downtown housing, excuse me, inner city housing development projects, out of 22, only one of them has been designated as mixed income, and that was the Savios Lofts. In this case, mixed income means market eight, excuse me, market rate and section eight, with the market for rent hovering uh, above or below $2 per square foot, and uh, with things like uh, Cherry Street Modern, uh, the City View Modern around Laurel Heights and Sac, uh, lofts starting at about $250,000. And so uh, with the decade of downtown and its goal of accomplishing 7,500 new housing units, can we hope to see, or at least have considered, uh, affordable housing for the student population or for young, single or married uh, college graduates making between $20,000 and $30,000 a year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. First, I have to start out with a correction because I did not refer to affordable housing as a nuisance. I said that as a result of market forces that affordable housing is usually located near nuisances. Oh yeah, my nuisance is my Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think what I would just say very quickly, and I'll let the others weigh in, is that kind of in answer to the previous young lady's question, for a long time I think the pendulum was swinging one way in that we were focusing all our efforts in relation to development in the inner city on affordable, and that was not resulting in the changes we need to see. And so we kind of swung the pendulum the other way where we've been focusing our efforts in the last probably six or seven years on how we can bring people who have more disposable income into the inner city. Though there have been a couple of bright spots that address some of the um, classes of folks that you talked about. I think the peanut factory redevelopment over on Frio Street near UTSA is going to provide some student housing. I know in District 2 that we've been working on the Merchants uh, Ice House Lofts, which is going to be of the style and character of the apartments on Broadway, but priced at a much lower uh, price point so that people who are maybe a first year teacher or you know, uh, in a working class job could possibly afford an apartment that's on the east side but situated very closely to downtown. Mm -hmm. So I think there definitely is a lot more work for us to do to strike, to strike that balance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Last question. Uh, Dr. Blasi from the sociology department. Uh, I'd like somebody to comment on uh, an old idea out of uh, Catholic social thought, John A. Ryan, 1905, my memory serves me right. Uh, that is a graduated property tax, graduated by size of the property. Uh, this could be used to uh, address issues of urban sprawl uh, as well as the transportation difficulties that uh, come with it. Uh, secondly, um, there were a lot of court settlements with banks uh, because of redlining that uh, required set-asides for um, uh, monies to go to uh, moderate and low-income housing in various cities throughout the country. And uh, while I do not anticipate more such court settlements, I wonder if some kind of policy could address uh, set-asides in the uh, funding of uh, development. And uh, thirdly, uh, when a neighborhood reaches the abandonment stage, uh, I would suggest that that be seen as an opportunity because uh, if the land can be claimed for the taxes, it could then be used as a subsidy for a developer to basically be given the land uh, on the condition that they develop it into, say, moderate uh, income housing. That's where the land trust would come in. Uh, it would be perfect. Uh, if it's a, a, a neighborhood that's already in the decline, uh, uh, doctor, that you would kick in a, a program like that. But you know, I used to, when I was on city council, I used to go to the National League of C Cities meetings uh, with um, Alex Briseño sometimes and everybody else. And uh, I would hear what cities like Seattle and San Francisco and um, uh, Detroit, um, uh, Portland, hate to bring up Portland, but Portland, uh, would have. Uh, and, 
and then I would come back to city council with all my notes and all the, the handouts, and I would be told that's never gonna happen in the city. I mean, I was told that by very important people. Uh, and, and some of them were, like the one I love is linkage fees. A linkage fee is, let's say a developer is building a, a skyscraper or some building. You provide a fee that links your needs, your public needs as a community with the growth. And then you have a little sum, maybe it's gonna be 0.002% of each square foot that you put in a fund. And the fund can be for affordable housing. Uh, one city, Seattle, was even using it for employment, uh, for employment training. Whatever your community decides that you need, you exact that from your, from your uh, developer and say, okay, we're gonna give you all this money. You're gonna have the privilege of building in our city. That's a great city. Uh, and this is what you have to do. But people think that if you do that, then people won't come to San Antonio. Well, you know what? I think we've had this syndrome, like a little girl that's really pretty, and she's like 15 years old, and this ugly guy comes, and, and that's who she goes with because she thinks there's not gonna be anybody better. And, and we, 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 have to, we have to quit having that complex and, and deal at the table with those developers. This is what we're giving you, and this is what our community needs. That's just one example, there are others. And I would talk myself blue in the face, but it was that, that's not gonna happen. Another one, that we have funds in banks in the city, a lot of money. So what if we, we got just a tiny little bit of the interest and put it in the housing trust fund that we have? We have a housing trust fund. I helped to create it. Uh, and why don't we put just a little bit in there? But we need like long-term money that's gonna be um, um, in injected into our budget to take care of those needs. But again, it's the political will in a community that sees that there's a need and that we have to change our ways. Charlie's gonna take us home, not literally, but. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed that. That was uh, one of our best community conversations, and for those who have never been here before, uh, this is what they're like. And uh, we hope to see you in February when we'll have yet another one. But I would be remiss if I didn't thank this really excellent group, beginning with Mayor Taylor, who, when I asked her, was not the mayor, <laughs> and continued in her commitment to be here uh, it was extraordinary. We hope that uh, this, this is your first visit as mayor to campus. But we certainly hope it will not be your last visit as mayor to campus. Maria, thank you so much for being here. Dr. Drennan, I really like your, your, your style, your lecturing style to get up and, and I, I, I couldn't sit there either. I understand what, you're, what, what that's about. Uh, and Carrie Clack, this is an excellent group and join me one more time in thanking them and thanking you for being here tonight. <laughs>